workshop and we'll start with some of this information about uh, the chemistry and other methods of management of alfalfa data forage uh, in terms of risk control. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with some of the chemistry of the industry on past this season, and then we'll end up with another first in sugar cane if it's not the object of the field. The thing that we are just uh -oh. Finish with is the alfalfa weaver, and we know it is like one of the most destructive insects here uh, in terms of the, the yield for alfalfa. And we, 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 do, we know that it could, like, could go with a lot of. Lose in terms of the yields. I don't know if you can see it here, but these plots here that we have, it's more of like demonstration plot established and alfalfa flu a few years ago. And you can see the difference between the treated one and not treated in terms of the color because this insect has these thin strips to like strip the leaves from or, or the stem from the leaflets. Uh, but in terms of like the, the chemistry that we are relying on for this insect, because we don't have much of biological uh, control agents so far, we are just investigating something here. And we have a new project that we will focus on this biological control. But we have like some of these active ingredients, mostly like pyrosolin and carbon, which is like steward. We have the uh, organophosphate, which is like and then some of these spinosis and some other chemicals that we can use as well. In the same way, those not span the label. There is some question about the efficacy of many of the virus roid. Even like in Dexcart, we are pushing the higher rate on the label as well. So these two are mostly like an organic system, it's not as much used in our system. But there is a new product that we have like it's given a couple of years now, then as well, and, and it showed like some good results. So we ended up with almost like not much in terms of diversity of the chemistry is here. And that's for this is, and that's put some uh, pressure on us when we are dealing with uh, uh, some of the management for alfalfa yields. And it's not only that, but we start to show some you know, signs of resistance, especially for erythroid. I still remember back in 2016, uh, one of our colleagues we had to people low up in Northern California. And he was like reporting and calling me sometimes about not as good, you know, management of some of the virus void up north in the intermountain area of California. And we have some reports as well after that from other northern areas and also in Canada as well in Alberta and some other areas. And like just in 2020 and the early 2021, we have some publication with our colleagues in Montana about some of these, you know, area, local area in certain western states like in Montana, Washington, Utah, and also New Mexico, where you have some local population that's resistance to many of these virus roids in the area. And this like spread a little bit like here, in one of these area here between the border of Montana and Utah, you can like see there is big area that had or, or started with a highly resistant population. Uh -huh. And you can see like it started to get between a little bit high, a little bit to the south and some moderate or like in the middle and third out to be um, population. Later on, and this is just, you know, in a matter of year or less. No. Yeah, yeah. Have some of this, you know, distribution of different population across western state like the green the color is like more of like susceptible population not much uh resistance when you have a yellow that's like in the intermediate stage when we have signs of moderate resistance and then the darker color of the brown one that's when you have more of the resistance again the picture here is almost the same we have some and uh, at the border here where you have, I'm sorry, uh, you, uh, Wyoming area where you have some of this resistance in the end, the uh, intermountain area and a little bit up north at, at Washington, uh, Oregon border. And we have big sign of 
wounding for us here because we have many of these resistant population across the river, the Colorado River between California and Arizona. In terms of ours here in central Arizona, it's like solid green here, and this is still like it's like an oasis here in terms of this resistant uh, 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 development in the area. And that's, you know, uh, up to 2022, we continue to follow, you know, the, the population here and also the population uh, across the border. Across the border. There's not much a change, the, the, the resistance is still there, and it's like developing. And we have like some samples this year. Uh, and we did it like over the years with, with many population coming from different uh, area in California, Arizona and other states. But we also like did, uh, you know, some of more distribution of what happened during the last few years uh, in terms of, you know, uh, what we are having here, here in Arizona. And the more that you have a solid color, whether it's like black or, or gray here, that's mean you still have a subtle population, it's not resistant. Uh, the more that you have in terms of the white or the checker color, that means you have this resistant population. Sorry, did you want that up there? Like here, so this is here the, the situation here, and in, in California compared to the situation in Arizona, you can see there is more of the white and checker uh, pattern here, which means we have more resistant population in California. We are still like a little bit, you know, in the same side, in most part of Arizona, except uh, these uh, areas in like. We did some resistant monitoring this year. We just finished them, you know, uh, about a month or so ago. And we did like some location in Central Arizona. We did some in Maricopa and uh, Buckeye, Arlington, some in, uh, from um, Scottsdale as well. And we found like there is there is still this population is quite susceptible. There is not much resistance there. If you look at these rates of the assay that we did, the 125 to like 625, we are getting 100% mortality after 48 hours. If the field rate, the higher field rate, it depends on the amount of water that you're applying. If you are applying uh, a 20 gallon, that would be your uh, equivalent rate or equivalent like rate here of about 750. If you are applying 10 gallons, that would be the half, 375. If you are applying something by air at five gallons, that would be the half of that. So we are still like here in this area, in central Arizona, are still doing holding on these virus roids. They are still there. They are still using them and they are still commit, like alternate them or something like index carb, and that will help us a little bit. But there is not much option. We need to be wise in terms of using them. How we can do that and how we approach this, you know, pure check of this uh, chemistry. This is here some of these. Epic trial that we are conducting uh, the last couple of years. This is one of them here in 2021. You can see we have, I, I picked here like an accumulative level of the threshold at three large larvae there per sweep. And you can see we have um, you know, a number of brothers that are still, still doing good in terms of holding the population way below uh, this threshold, like warrior, uh, Venezuela has a different trade. Of course, we, we lost, you know, the cobble because it had uh, the, the kind of a straight in it and we also uh, uh, small stock span as well. And we have decision steward also working good on holding the population under the threshold. Similar thing happened, you know, the following year in like year 2022, we are still having good population again, a uh, good control of the population with uh, the same product here. And it's still holding and it's still like we have good mix of these chemistries that we can use. But on the other hand, we have some problems too, because that's happening in, uh, you know, at MAG, this is our, our exercise at MAG. But we can, I'm, I'm getting like a lot of cold and we are getting samples like these in the season. This is just happened. You know, this season, and you can get this is only five sweeps, and we stopped counting after 100 plus. 
And in this, you know, in this area, when we test this uh, population, it is not resistant, but it's more like very overwhelming population because what? Because we have thresholds that didn't be or never been used in this situation. We let the, the, the threshold go from, you know, our situation based on like Kyla's work is one to four. This larva based on how much you spend in application and how much are expecting in terms of the hay price. But if you go beyond that, you will not be able with some of these chemistries to manage this insect with a higher population like me. So this threshold like have been done with like multi-year work, with like uh, times like PhD, uh, like the main uh, part of it. We have publication for it. You might want to like, uh, uh, read them. It's quite entertaining, I think. And it's all based on the large larva here of this, of this insect. And we have even an app for that. So you can go there and you can like, if you want to like scan this QR code, you can go to this app, you can plug in your number in terms of the population you have, the sweep, and then what you expect in terms of the size of hay or sun, and can give you, you know, a population, you make your decision based on. With that, it would be like hopefully easy for uh, doing, you know, this kind of managing of this insect with a good stewardship of the chemistry as we have. Because like there is a huge difference between if, if we go a little bit back between like this, these numbers here, this is here like, I'm sorry, this here, your yields, and you are getting very close to one and a half tons for this one. That's good, right? But with good population or good management, you are getting like 2.8. That's a very big difference between the two. And no matter what was the price of today's hay, you can justify this kind of management even more than one time a season. So this is just, you know, one scenario here when you drag your, your uh, circle here, this is like more of a, a scale in terms of the, uh, the fight for hay here. And this is here, how much it will cost you. And it will give you here number for larva, their sweeps that you can base your decision at. This is here, um, more of like a, a video if you would like to see it about some of this style that we did at Mac. And we just, you know, close a drone over. This is different treatment here, and you have the name. And some of these would be like having a code name. This is a penazolin one coming. Yeah, this is a penazolin one at the lower rate. So you can see like most of these are still green, they have some yellows there, but still like holding and getting some good hearing for, for, for the crop. This is the benazolin at like the intermediate rate, the 1.5 ounce. This is the penazone at the high rate, the two ounce. And, this one, and compare that to the coming one. Yeah. This yellow one. You can expect that to be untreated, right? Yeah. And, and they are very, in very close proximity, but still, like the, the plot are holding and they are quite integrated. And we tested that many times. So this is this is the, the, the result of this so far. So don't forget this, this app here. And the thing is that we are preaching all the time is that you want to try to go and start early. You don't want to like leave it from like managing something around one to four per suite. And like here you are managing about 25 per suite. That's a big difference. And especially with the chemistries that we are having right now, the, the, the like uh, coverage of this or most of these chemistries, how we can reach the insect, all of that are factors here. So, it's, it's, it's something we need to talk about and need we, we just like, we, we will repeat that all of the time. We talk about it a lot. Because the more I think we'll talk, hopefully it will be like more of the norm for us. The other insect, that's this group of like alfalfa aphid, you know, like there are four of them here. The major of them is a pea aphid and blue alfalfa aphid, a greenish one like that. For many years now, we have this, you know, continuous continuing uh, outbreak of this insect. And again, we did some work on them for, for the threshold for 
this NSIC found most of the time when we have this steep relationship between AFID and the E, it's mostly coming from uh, uh, blue alpha alpha AFID and also dry conditions because we found that was like more of wet condition like this year, this seed. We can like have uh, some, I'm sorry, some uh, natural infection of some of this, some of these pathogenic uh, fungi, and they are doing a good role in terms of managing this NSIC naturally. Again, for like the chemistries, we are like maybe like having uh, better choices here with, uh, with aphids. We have many of the selective insecticide as well. So it's not as pressing as the uh, alfalfa weevil, and many of them are still holding and still doing good. As I said, we have many of these, uh, or not many actually, mainly two of these entomopathogenic fungi that uh, in our area they, they are here naturally, and they are mostly belong to the Idaria species and Zoptera. And we isolated some of them, and we even like using some of them in our trial as a commercial formula. I know a couple of our PC. PC are using this formula in their field. Some of them even know that in this field they have the natural infection. They can go a little bit with what they call a flash irrigation. They just make sure that there is a little bit of moisture under the canopy, and that will enhance or like the spread of this. Uh, of this one just initiates the spores, and the spore will like bring the hyphae, and the hyphae will infect all of these aphids. And for for a couple of them, there is many years now without any application or any insecticide application for uh, aphids in the area because they have good natural infection and good natural occurrence of this uh, fungus and they are you know propagating them encouraging them year after year and this is some of the work that one of our grad students uh, Rebecca House about this you know uh, some of this entomobacygenic fungus this is about the direct infection here for two of them, the Isaria and Ovaria bassiana. And you can see like the Isaria is giving a little bit higher in terms of mortality, mortality rate in a lab work, you know, about 60%. And it's not as, as good in the uh, Ovaria. We didn't see much of activities for Ovaria in the field, but we wanna see also if there's anything in the lab in terms of the indirect uh, uh, infection too, and mortality still, uh, uh, Isaiah is doing better about, at about 40% compared to the Bulgaria lower than 40%. And that's what we see in the field as well. This is here, the commercial formula of the uh, Iberia species. You can see we are counting aphid here, but when we take it to the lab and we allow it to stay in the bag for a little bit, just overnight, it will turn from green to brown because it's already infected. And show it here in the yield. The yield here coming out of this uh, treatment is almost equivalent to the best of this uh, uh, conventional insecticide. So that's about if, and then we'll switch here to one insect that we are uh, about to get. Hopefully, like not as, as high pressure as a lot couple of years, but this is like the sugar cane aphid, and we know like it came. Uh, way back started like in the uh, in the east southeast um like maybe like uh starting 2013 and then by 2015 it was like in many uh, areas in different states from like florida all the way to uh, new mexico and by 2016 it came to our state here and still and stayed there and this is now like the the distribution of it's like very huge and just like very few years this insect were very people. This is like very. I I have like a lot of um, admiring of this. You know, if it, it just switch it feeding, they just make a good distribution. I think they switch it genetics. So there is a lot of like uh, good study of work around this ethic and what we did very short time. But for us here, this is like the aphid here, a small yellowish aphid. And you have this black tip on, in the antenna and the legs and also the cornicles. Most of the time when we see them on the sorghum, and this is like the host of them now, it's like mostly like sorghum as a species, like sorghum, spang grass, and other Johnson grass, and other wild grasses from the same, from the same genus. And this is here, uh, the insect itself adds, you can like confuse them with other, you know, aphids like 
the corn leaf aphid or the green bugs, but the corn leaf aphid is like more of like the head and the first couple of segments of the short are darker as well. The whole leg is dark, not as uh, uh, as the uh, is here only the tax. And the green bug is quite different, it's a bit larger, you know, uh, oval in shapes. So there is a difference between these, you know, three species or three aphid. Corn leaf aphid and green bugs, they start early in the season. They don't like to tolerate much of our heat here. And you cannot find them maybe like after food stage in sorghum. So this is here one of the, you know, a little bit of relief. We don't, we are not dealing with three of these species. Uh, one of them. This is some of the symptoms here in our plot. You can see, like this, if it is, is capable of just destroying the whole the whole plot, and even like at, at certain times when you have some of these, you can see, like even here, because of the amount of like uh, dew on the uh, on the leaflet, you can like end up with a lot of uh, uh, fungus that you can even see on on the spire here. So it's quite destructive. It's, we have like mainly two um, ways, like let's put them three, like two of them are chemical one, you know, culture. We will, we will deal with the chemical one and we have like more of like foliar application at the time. We can see this insect, which is mostly here in our area around, you know, the second half of August. And uh, the other one is more of like an insurance uh, control method. That's one thing or one control method that we are applying the insecticide at planting time. So we are actually like covering the soil around the seeds at the planting time to make sure that it will be there if the infestation or the insect come up later in the season. So this is some of the data here over a couple of years uh, that we have uh, for the foliar application and what we call the injection or the infero injection application. So the, the, you can see here, like we have group of these selective insecticides that are working quite good on putting the population uh, at check. And this population is quite varied year after year. So like here, I'm, here you can see like some of these are the accumulated uh, population of these uh, insect can reach like 400 per, uh, per leaf. That's very high, but still, yeah. you know, compared to the 500, which like we think like, the threshold here, it's still doing good. This is here, same year, but for the inferior injection. This is the, the method that we are treating, you know, the, the toil and the seed at the beginning of the season and wait and see. And we do it mostly with savanta. That's what we do at the beginning. And we do it like at three rates, one at like uh, uh, one ounce, two ounce, I'm sorry, one ounce, two ounce, and four ounce of savanta at the beginning of, of the year. This is like the new formula of savanta back in the days. This was like double that, two, four, and eight. And we also like uh, do that with foliar application to see if there is any difference. So far, like the, the injection itself is quite good by its own. If you add the foliar, it will give you a little bit of relief. But we don't see this. Foliar application only is comparable to what we see in the uh, in the previous slide. And as you can see here, like it's almost like we are putting in the 500, but many of these uh, uh, foliar injection put it back way to maybe under 200. So it's a little bit better than the foliar application for this year when you are comparing year to year, almost at the same location. In terms of, again, in 2021, the foliar application is a completely different here because we have much rain at the time. And if you look here, the threshold that we bought here is quite lower. It's only like 60 accumulated here. And you can see like majority of the insecticide are working quite good at that. But it was different here, and we didn't even like see much difference in the years because it was very low population. In a year like that, you know, the inferno injection would be like an insurance you never need. But in 2020 and 20, like 22, that's an insurance you really need. So it depends on a lot of conditions here and what you uh, want to do with a, like you want like a peace of mind, or you just like make sure that you will have the equipment at the right time when you have the infestation later in the season because this insect, this aphids very capable of, I don't know how many time or how many fold 
they can increase the, the population just like in the age. You have like quite high reproductive ability. So the other way of like managing or controlling this, uh, managing this insect is by early planting. I can see like right now we have uh, a couple of folks who are start plant, planting sorghum. And we did found like for study over a couple of years that we should plant in early, which is like around this time, like late April, early May. Don't let it go until late May. Um, uh, late May. So planting early around, you know, late April, early May can, you know, give us a chance to escape from this uh, the infestation of this cancer or give like sorghum not on. So it happened here like in this year and also a couple of other years when you have only, that's, that's what we see all season. Just, you know, at the beginning of the season, we have some of the green bugs and we have some of the, the corn leaf uh, aphid, but we didn't see any sugar cane in later in the season. So this is one of the thing or one of the method cultural controls that we can use to escape the infestation of this aphid and to make sure that we don't have the, 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 the catch here is that you need to choose your variety of sorghum. Not all our varieties are working good when they don't have this you know, heat accumulation to get them enough degree days uh, to get the right yield that we need. We, we have like some of these varieties that can work good when you are planting them a month earlier. Okay. So we just, you know, uh, not just, but like a few months ago, we had this publication about some of these uh, uh, results we have. It's not all of them, but some of them we are working on, on the rest. If you want to scan this QR code, it will take you there with some of this information about managing uh, sugarcane aphids in Arizona. With that, I would like to thank all of you. And if you have any questions. Uh, whenever you put the savanto uh, at planting, do you inject it below the seed or on the seed? You will. You will just. You you actually just behind. You have this. You know, one 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 nozzle with one hole, and you just inject while you are covering. So you are not like directly treating the seed. You are actually treating the soil that will cover the seed when when the machine is just covering. So you can use like the fertilizer injection yeah. system, just yeah. the same. Okay. All right. I just one one comment going back to alfalfa. That's that's a big crop. Was this this spring was a lot of wind and erratic weather. Uh -huh. All season it's been like that. And we have a a John Deere high cycle, and we have a real good operator on it. And when he sprays, the booms like this. It's not like this, and it's not going up and down. And and he keeps it about the same height, and he runs at a at a modest speed. We could tell the difference in, in our alfalfa, what he treated and what we had to treat by air under sometimes not, not the best of conditions because those guys were getting there, you know, when they could and had to deal with, with, with the wind until it got too big. But uh, you could you could tell by, by what it produced and also by how it looked when we had aphids and weevils and also when we the weevils were gone and we just had aphids like right now. You just like talking about my life for the last like three, four months, I have like a lot of cold. Oh, we just sprayed, but in this area, we didn't see like any effects. Why is that? Like, how did you spray? Is it a windy day? Is it like by a plane? And like, we we're trying to, you know, well, I mean, if you go in the power and going to the, the other power direction. lines and fences and stuff like that, it makes it makes it tough for a ground rig, but almost impossible for an airplane. We've had some grasshoppers lately, and and uh, yeah, it, they it, come out of they come out of fallow fields that got weeds growing in them or come off the desert. And uh, they're pretty tough, especially in a little field that's all edges. Very tough. So it just like became part of doing the job. I am on the alfalfa treatments. Did you happen to try to look for any impacts on lichus populations in the alfalfa when you treated with transform? Uh, it looks like it was moderately good on the aphid but i kind of wondered if because later in the season we see migrations of yeah. ligus coming out of there if there was a 
a double effect, maybe if you have low populations of ligus in that alfalfa at that time, maybe we're doing some good. I, I, I know it happened because, like, leave it or not, this was part of my PhD. Like, I was I was doing that on purpose. Sometimes I was cutting some alfalfa <clears throat> to make sure that whatever ligus there would move to the other crop. So, yeah, we, we are doing that all of the time with all of the cut. Yeah, we can, like, kill some. With all of the treatment, we can kill some, but there is still remaining some of these, especially at the summertime with the summer slump and when the plants start to flower early and at many fields, we just like leave them. And with these flowers come more of these like as bugs. And then once you cut, you will move to the cotton at the right stage. And when you have like, oh, is that outbreak I just sprayed last week or something? No, just your neighbor somehow cut. That's why we, we were like in our new uh, project, we are trying to find out how insects are moving around and also not insects, but also natural enemies because we know a little bit about the pest, but we don't know much about how natural enemies are moving even like from, you know, a crop to a desert plant and again to another crop and then going the cycle. And that would, you know, can inform us how to use these natural enemies more effectively. Raymond, I think the first part of his question is about transform. Are those apicidal rates you're using, half ounce, ounce, are are you measuring ligus at all in there to see if you're having we, an effect? We measure, we measure them like that. There's two years. And at the time, Transform was working quite good because we were using 1.5. That's a higher rate. Yeah. What, are, you're not using that rate now for a right? So it's, it, was, it was working quite good in like almost every second most part of the Sure, I had an ounce and a half, but that's... I, th I think the high rate for cotton is 2.2 and a quarter ounces, two point, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 2.5. Yeah. 2.5, okay. I'm in the, and Peter, need to talk to Judy Runner about the, the, the effort what that was made just recently to try to ban transform in Arizona. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, they they did in California. They just made, made them use these awful products trying to control lives populations when you had a perfectly good material that would preserve the beneficials. But anyway, well, they took belt away from us on, on worms and alfalfa a few years ago. The bar chart. The alfalfa bar chart. Which one? With the with the chemicals. The, it would have been at the beginning of the. One for. There was a. Uh, that's one. No, uh, that one, maybe. Was there a bar chart, though, of different chemical efficacies in alfalfa? Yeah. Maybe it's that one. There's, yeah, those two. Uh, go up one, that one. Maybe that's the one I want to see. It's horrible. 